no idea what he's here to speak about, but this is Eric. He's been a speaker at TEDx. That's pretty cool. Oh, look at the crowds are coming. Please, please, please don't sit at the back. Come down the front. Let's make this uh, uh, nice and intimate and cozy. Gezellig for the Dutch in the room. Where are you guys all from? Where are you from? Whereabouts? From Nijmegen. How about you guys? Where are you coming in from? The UK. Ah, Nieuwegein. Anybody from a little bit further away? Arnhem, okay. Not the most international. How about you guys? Where are you from? Breda. Wow, this ri you got the whole of the Netherlands represented here. Anybody from the north? That'll be me, Groningen. Come join us, sir. Come take a seat. All right. Eric was born ready. I mentioned he, uh, he, he is or was, I don't know if he's still doing it, TEDx speaker. And I was scrolling through his profile looking for something interesting to find. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but he's the, in the top 100 global social innovators under 35, no less. Is that still true? Still under 35. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, he's here to talk to you, I think, a little bit about culture. What I need you to do is give him a huge, warm round of applause. And I don't mean just a bit of a sandwich round of applause. What I need for you is for the whole of that room over there to go, what the hell is going on over there? So I want claps, whistles, <laughs> cheers, yelling. Hi, folks. Come take a seat. Not at the back. Come take a seat here at the front. Yes, you too. I am looking at you. Keep walking all the way to the end. Huge, huge, huge round of applause for Eric, no, 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 no. We're getting there. We're warming up. This is not amateur hour. I said a huge think rock star. I think they almost heard at that table. Almost at that table. Right? They're still working. Almost. Still working. Not even distracted. Yeah. Wait, you're all cool startup kids, right? How about a huge disruptive round of applause for Eric? Go for it! Woo! Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Um, I can't even pronounce half of the places you're from. I'm from Canada, Western Canada, actually, and I'm flying back tomorrow. I've got about an 11-hour flight. So it's really great to be here to see the future really now. And I think that that's really, really exciting. And when we talk about the future of the workplace in a technologically integrated world, I think one thing that we often tend to forget is the importance of people and the interaction of people. Uh, so I've got 29 minutes before someone else takes the stage here, so I'm going to have to fly through this very quickly. Um, if there are any questions or you do want to have a quick conversation after, I'll stick around at the back. Uh, but I don't think we're going to get time for many questions uh, during the presentation. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are on Twitter right now. Twitter handle is my last name, which I understand is a bit of a mouthful. Of course, hashtag CPEU4, uh, and on Facebook too, I've just got a, a new page, with, which is my full name. So like I said, when we talk about the future of work, we're here in one of the largest tech conferences in Europe, uh, primarily targeted at students. But this conversation, actually, it's not about technology at all. Really what I want to talk about today is um, people. And when we talk about people, really I want to talk about rethinking work and what it means. Because when you see a hackathon that's going on here, when you see groups of people that are really coming together, there's the thing, of course, that we're trying to solve, the problem that we're trying to fix. But what's most interesting to me is to see how people like yourselves are really interacting and coming together to provide a real solution to a problem that the world has identified. Uh, who am I and where did I come from? You might have seen a video uh, that was circulating around on Twitter. So I, like I said, I came from Canada. Uh, I was in New York on the weekend speaking uh, at a conference there, Rome a couple days ago, and just here for the day. So again, really excited to be here and thank you for your time. Like I said, when we're talking about culture, we're talking about people, there's three things that I really want to consider for the presentation today. Number one is technology. Number two is community. And number three is culture. And I think when we talk about the future of work, we really need to consider all three aspects. So what I'm going to try and do today is really challenge perspective, challenge what we've been thinking about for so long when it comes to people, workplaces, and culture, and ultimately leave you with a different thought process around what it means to work with people in the future of work. So the first thing I want to talk about is technology. And this is something that everyone, of course, sitting here is very familiar with. Uh, Cisco, I saw, is a big sponsor, and they said that this year we've entered the zettabyte era, which of course is a thousand, 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 thousand megabytes crossing uh, over the internet just this year alone. 
And what does that mean? That means there are two, uh, the equivalent of 250 billion DVDs worth of information being transmitted now, which is exponentially higher than, than uh, ever before. I was at a conference actually with IBM that was speaking, and one of the heads of, of the creation of Watson actually told me that 90% of the data created, or 90% of the data on the web now has been created in the past two years alone. So this exponential inf inf information or integration of information is really changing the way not only we work, but how we live and how we're growing up as well. And so when we talk about work-life balance, this is something we'll hear a lot about, but I think work-life balance is a bit passe. It's a bit old school. I think instead of work-life balance right now, we're looking at work-life integration because no longer are we talking about the nine to five workday. We're not talking about checking in and checking out. Work isn't so much transactional like it was in the past. Work is a big identifier of who we are. And we're able to work while we're eating, while we're driving, while we're on the train. We're able to check emails and get things done right before we go to sleep. And so work then is a better identifier, right, of who we are. I want to talk about the 24-hour day, of course, and, and talk about how we actually break that down. So in Canada, uh, our stats, uh, Canada tells us that we travel about 24 minutes to and from work every day. Uh, in addition to that, we talk about prep time. So whether we're getting dressed, doing our hair, brushing our teeth, uh, making meals and things like that, getting ready for our day, perhaps getting our kids ready. Uh, in addition to prep, of course, is our us time. The time that we're reading, the time that we're playing sports, the time that we're watching TV or Netflix. I know there are a bunch of millennials here in the room today. Uh, what we do more than just uh, our, our, our time is, of course, sleep. So we might sleep six, seven, perhaps, if we're lucky enough, eight hours a day. But what we do more than anything else is work. And I think that that's really interesting is work that we do, work we do now, or even 20 years ago, was still more than we did anything else in a day. And so when we talk about the ability to multitask or to be productive when traditionally we couldn't actually be productive, then work has to become a better identifier of who we are. And so the first question that I want to pose to you when you're here today, when you're building, this is an entrepreneurial stage, when you're building the company, are you attracting talent and hiring based on just skills? Or are you attracting and hiring based on fit as well? Because if these people are going to be people that you're communicating with, building your lives with, and ultimately growing with as well, is it just going to be the skill sets that you're trying to attract and retain? Or is it going to be friends that you're trying to create and build as well? And so I want to talk a little bit about community and things later. I think we need to talk too a little bit about technology and how it's not just about this next generation or us as well. Now, I don't want anyone to think that this is a One Direction concert or anything like that, but the difference eight years makes, this is actually at St. Peter's Square to see the Pope. And so when we talk about technology and integration, I saw someone who was, I'm gonna guess about 65 playing virtual baseball out there with the VR headset on. And to think that this, t this technological shift or change is just for this generation or the next generation, uh, is also wrong as well. And so when we talk about work and technology, really what we're talking about is a world that's more connected than it's ever been before. We talk about the internet of things and this rapid integration of technology into the workplace. But my question is, when we talk about the future of the workplace with respect to people, in a world that's increasingly connected, are we connecting or are we becoming disconnected as people? Because what I think is happening, especially in a corporate workplace, is that we're dehumanizing the workplace, that people are becoming less and less important, that we have less face-to-face -face conversations, less conversations that are meaningful, less relationships that are truly built. And so when we talk about the future of work and we talk about the integration of technology, really, I wonder, are we talking about people? And what does that really look like? Because there's another thing, and, and, and f Put your hands up, please, if, if you're a millennial. So if you're born between about eight, 1980 and 1995-ish. And so how many of us, myself included, of us millennials uh, are sick of kind of the stereotypes where we're narcissistic, job hopping, we live in our parents' basement, we watch Netflix all day, and we don't really know how to work, right? And so I think that when we're trying to generalize people for the wrong reasons, it's really hard to close a communications and age and a talent gap in the workplace. But if we stop talking about these generations as these 15-year cohorts and stereotype them based on their most negative qualities, then really I think we can actually bring people together. But at the same time, too, these generational problems aren't new. 
In fact, this quote is one of my favorite ones, and I wonder if anyone can guess who it is. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. Does anyone know whose quote this is? Socrates. So this is about a 2,400-year-old quote, which is really interesting. I've got one more really wordy one that I'm going to fly through. Today, suddenly, because all the people in the world are part of one electronically-based, intercommunicating network, young people everywhere share a kind of experience that none of the elders ever had or will have. Conversely, the older generation will never see repeated in the lives of young people their own unprecedented precedent, precedented experience of sequentially emerging change. It's a bit wordy, obviously. This break between generations is wholly new, it's planetary, and it's universal. This quote is from 1969. And when we were talking about this at lunch, Ilya and myself, we were talking about the memory of an iPhone or an Android phone and how many times bigger the memory in our phone is than the memory that actually it took to land the space shuttle on the moon. And so I've actually got a bit of a theory around generations and age that I really want to share with you because I don't think there's any value in talking about people based on the year that they were born. Let me get into this a little bit. Everyone here, I'm sure, has heard of Moore's Law. Well, there's another theory called the knowledge doubling curve, which basically says before 1900, the amount of information that humans had access to doubled about every 100 years. After 1900, though, the amount of information that we had access to doubled at an exponential rate. So from 1900 to 1950, the amount of information that we had access to doubled. From 1950 to 1975, it doubled again. From 75 to 88, it doubled again. To 93, it doubled again. Uh, to the point now uh, that the amount of information that we have access to doubles every 13 months and is continuing to double even faster. Uh, what IBM has said is that the amount of information that we'll have access to due to the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence will actually double every 13 hours before we actually cap out. Now, that doesn't mean you and, and myself are twice as smart. That just means there's twice as much information that we have access to. And so if that's the case, I want to challenge you with something that would suggest that the construct of a generation is a false construct in that the idea of generations that we talk about today actually doesn't exist. And let me go through this a little bit. Because if the amount of information is exponentially increasing, then the time span a generation actually would have to shrink at an inverse rate for that integration of technology. I'm going to say that one more time. The time span that a generation occupies, so we've got, we've got baby boomers, we've got Gen X, we've got Gen Y, we've got Gen Z. They're all about 15-year cohorts. Okay? But because technology is changing at such an exponential rate, the time span that these generations occupy, in my opinion, actually is going to have to shrink. Because if the world that we grow up in is changing so fast, that means the language and the way that we communicate with each other is as well. I grew up in the back of a car or on a train reading a book. My brother had some electronic Game Boy device that he would play with, and now kids are dealing with 4G, LTE, connected with everything to the point that we can actually automate a lot of the learning and development that we've got. You can see parents that can just hand an iPad to their kid to, to quiet them down, and, and we never had that. And so the idea of generations really separating people to say that millennials are these things, Gen Z are these things, Gen X are these things, is really a gross misunderstanding of people. Because in the United States, we can look at perhaps 80 million people born between 1980 and 1995. And I don't know about you, but I can't even generalize my family to suggest that we're all the same, let alone 75 million people, 80 million people. And so the knowledge doubling curve, in my opinion, actually changes the way that we talk about people. And we have to start appreciating people based on values and desired experiences instead of just the age or the year that they were born. So really, what this comes down to is creating workplaces of belonging, of fit. Really, this comes down to building community. Because if you look, for example, <coughs> at uh, digital marketing agencies in, in the United States, there are 3,874 of them. A lot of them actually do the same thing. If you look at accounting practices or business analysts or someone like that, a lot of the, the, the tasks, the things that we do from company to company are the same, especially if you're an accountant. You can be an accountant uh, at a football stadium, at a coffee shop. You can be an accountant at KPMG or Deloitte or for the government. And what we do 
is largely the same, but the culture within of these places is vastly different. And if we're trying to differentiate our organizations as we're trying to grow them, I think it's really advisable to talk about what do you love about your job? What makes you happy? At the end of the day, you've got a smile on your face when your head hits the pillow. Tell that story because it's going to be different than someone else in another organization who might not share that same experience. But if we look at a job description today, it's really not a job description at all. It's a skills and requirements checklist, right? Do you have this education? Do you have this skill set? Do you have this many years of experience? Well, that's great, but so do 15,000 other people who might be applying for that job. And if there's no differentiation, if there's no community, if there's no understanding of the values and the experiences of these different positions, how can we really be sure that we're bringing on the right person? And so let me just, for the sake of it, because I think this is fun, go through some of the numbers of the cost of turnover <coughs> as we start to build lar larger organizations. Say we've got 1,000 people in our companies, okay? And of that, 34% are millennials, which is statistically about where it's at. If it costs about 25,000 American dollars, we'll say 20,000 20, euros, we'll just keep it round. Uh, but the average tenure for these people coming into the workplace is 18 to 24 months. It's a $7 million expense because we fail to understand our cultural components and actually spend that much trying to turn employees over and keep up instead of being proactive and really telling a story of who we are, how we're connected to what we're doing, what the purpose behind our work is, and ultimately how we're trying to make the world a better place, right? And so I think there's something that I, I really want to, to connect here. We've got a lot of group activities, whether it's CrossFit or yoga or, or, or cycling classes or, or football or whatever that might be, and the startup community. And I connect these two because what I think this really comes down to is, is team, collaboration, and really just working together. Because if you look at a big corporation right now, as I mentioned before, it seems fragmented in that we connect and, and talk and type and, and, and email to each other without actually having face-to-face -face conversations. And so I can be sitting beside someone right beside my desk and be typing to them without actually having meaningful communication. But when we're playing sports, when we're in these hackathons, when we're actually connecting with people in the startup world, I think we're actually able then to communicate with each other, come together, collaborate, and create and experience and interact and relate in ways that other organizations that are larger can't. And I was speaking in Los Angeles with the CEO of Accenture North America, and, and what she said was that the interesting thing between startups and well-established corporations is that startups create. You guys, we, we create. We don't have to recreate. And I think that's really interesting, too, because we're doing this for the first time. And if we can tell our story, what we really love about our job, to attract that person who wants that same experience, really what we can do is be proactive to culture instead of being reactive to it and trying to hire the next person based on just skills. Because you're going to see a lot of people here with a similar skill set, but based on fit, telling that story, really articulating your values and the experience of the work you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're connected to it, how you really feel ownership to it, is really important. Which obviously talks then about culture. And culture, in my opinion, is creating an atmosphere or an environment where people do the best work they can do because they want to do it and not because they feel like they have to. Where you're not on vacation, but you're not being driven to the bone to get that work done either. Where you're not performing and you're not trying to please and impress, you're just able to be. And if we can tell that story and bring on those people who really share those values, share those desires, be invested in the organization, both in, a, in, in an emotional and a financial way, then really I think there's an opportunity to create fantastic workplaces where we actually don't feel like we have to work. And that's been the whole goal of the company that I've been trying to create, is that if we can bring the right people together with complementary skill sets, all looking to make a positive change in the way that we work, the way that we speak, the way that we live, then really I don't feel like I'm coming to work at all. And I think the people that are here are such a perfect example of what great culture can look like. Because you see people spending 24 hours sitting at their computer trying to solve a big problem, all with the shared values and desired experiences of coming to the same conclusion. Which is why having an event like this, where bringing people together, is so fantastic. Where we talk really about 
values, experiences, and feelings. And I know this stuff sounds soft, and it really is, but that is the differentiator. And so I want to challenge you guys. Are we looking for a best culture? I don't think so, because a best culture doesn't exist. A best culture for you is not going to be a best culture for me. A best culture for you might not be a best culture for me, which might not be a best culture for you. But what we can do is optimize our culture. If we can understand who we are, what we value, what differences we're trying to make, I think ultimately we can actually create the best work culture for us and not for anyone else. Because if you look at the United States right now and the Fortune top 100 companies, number one is Google, not really a surprise there, but number four is a grocery chain, like supermarket. And if you were to leverage that as your recruiting tool to say we've got one of the best 100 workplaces you know, to work in, in America, that really doesn't do any good without understanding what makes it such a great place to work. And so again, if you can differentiate what our organizations are and talk about the people that are there, what they love about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they interact together, I think ultimately we can create fantastic, fantastic places to work. And I know we've heard about <laughs> mission, vision, values so many times, so let's not talk about mission, vision, values, let's talk about mission, vision, people. So our MVP statement, which is something that I'm truly, really trying to push. Because if we talk about the mission and vision and the values, and we've got that alignment right from the start, that we bring on those people that really share the values of the organization, then really are we talking about the values of the organization or the values of the people? Well, I think it's both. And I think that if we can talk about mission, vision, and people, and how the people are contributing to the vision and the mission, then it's top down and bottom up, and that alignment is gonna be so true when taking our organizations to the next level that we don't have to talk about the product or the service, we can talk about the people's relationship to the product and the service. And if we can actually bring the service or product to life by highlighting one of our employees and how they actually react and relate to what that product is, then really it's about people, right? And so there are a few things that I want you to consider, six to be exact, as I'm kind of running out of time that I see. And there, there are these six things, and I'm gonna go into each of them for about one minute each. When we're talking about people, I'll go back just for that. Uh, when we're talking about people, number one, I want you to stop generalizing people. Because if we talk about millennials, if we talk about Gen Z, if we talk about boomers, we talk about males, we talk about females, we talk about Canadians, we talk about Dutch people. The thing is, is we can't generalize any of them. Each person has a different value set, a different skill set, a different desired experience. And unless we can understand who it is we're trying to attract and why, we'll never bring on the right person. And that doesn't mean they have to be between 18 and 25, female, with two or three years experience. If we share that desired value set and skill set and experience, then it's not about the cohort, it's about the individual. So again, stop generalizing. Number two is appreciate or articulate the values and experiences. And again, this is where we get a little bit soft. But the job description isn't a description of the job, it's a skills and requirements checklist. And so if we can talk about the things that we love about our jobs, if we can talk about why we're there, a case study of how often we communicate, what teamwork and collaboration really looks like, how mentorship is really practiced in the organization, instead of just saying, well, you have to have five years experience in this level of education, really we're not differenti differentiating our organizations at all. So articulating the values and the experiences of the job is essential as we talk about the future of work. And of course, to articulate them, you have to clearly understand your culture. And understanding your culture doesn't necessarily mean trying to compare it with other organizations. It means really understanding who we are, what environment we're working in, and how we can thrive and optimize, from, or optimize culture from the environment that's created. Because again, the Google environment is not something I would focus on recommending to other organizations that aren't Google because it's only right for Google and the people that are working there and why they're working there. But if you work at a, t at a, a strictly a tech firm or a tech startup or an insurance or even in the resources, you look at solar or wind or forestry, all of these different people are gonna value a different experience. And so clearly understanding your culture, who's there and what environment's been established is going to be essential. And number four is build community. So again, if we can bring people together based on like values, based on what it is their desires are in terms of building a better community, a better place to work, and a better life, 
the line that I'm using with my company is that if we can, uh, if we can improve people's lives at work, we can improve people's lives. Because again, if we work more than we do anything else in a day, especially in a world where we can be more pro productive and multitask than ever before, we have to be building community and that has to be a priority or we'll con continue to see workplace anxiety and dissatisfaction in the workplace rise. And I firmly believe that there are organizations out there that can actually reverse this trend just simply by providing organizations with the tools to change this conversation and make it about people. Number five is understand how people work. Now we're living in a world that's more flexible, more remote, and more capable than ever before. And so an example is that I was, I'm living in Western Canada and I had, I had my dad come and visit me, which was fantastic. And he said he wanted to go for a hike on a Tuesday. I said, Dad, you don't go for a hike on Tuesday. We got work to do. And he said, no, 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 we'll be fine. And so when we got to the top of the mountain, he was the first one to suggest, okay, I'm going to sit down, send a couple emails out and make a couple phone calls. And we're on the top of a mountain. I said, well, you know, okay, that sounds fine. Uh, but to think, too, that this idea of remote and flexible work is just something that's desired by the next generation or something that's offered to the next generation is incorrect either. And so, again, if we can bring on the right people, understand what we're able to offer and create that fantastic experience, then I think understanding how people work and providing them with the tools necessary to do their best work is really important. Number six in the final, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier as well, is the individual is, of course, greater than the cohort. We're not trying to attract these people. We're trying to attract this person. And if you think we can measure success by the number of applications on our desk for a job, I think that's incorrect. Because if we're looking for a certain person with these values, these desired experiences, of course, this skill set, this education, these requirements, then the application pile of 3,000 might go down to 75 but it's 75 people who crave that experience. And if that individual ha can reverse, uh, reverse mentor or do a reverse interview, is what I, I like to call it, where the individual is interviewing the company or you just as much as you're interviewing the individual, then a relationship starts right off the bat. I think that's really important. And so this conversation was supposed to be about the future of the workplace. And it is, but more importantly, it's about the future of people in that workplace. And I think that if we can really focus on creating these places where people can come together, collaborate, build community, then we've got fantastic opportunity for the workplace ahead. And so this last thing I'll leave you with is this, is this quote, one of my favorite authors, and it says, those three things, autonomy, complexity, and a connection between effort and reward are, most people agree, the three qualities that work has to have if it's to be satisfying. It's not about how much money we make that ultimately makes us happy between nine and five, it's whether our work fulfills us. And I think that even if we have 100 people today that start to build these organizations of the future, organizations that I call are future ready, then we can optimize our environment, our culture, and our people, and one organization at a time create fantastic places to work. Thank you very much, guys. I'm Eric Tremundi. Woo! And Eric, you did a great job because you got four minutes left, four which minutes. by my take means that we got room for two, maybe three questions. <coughs> okay. Don't all rush. Who wants to be first? Go on, give me a wave. Somebody must have a question. It's fantastic material. There we go. <laughs> What's your name? What's your question? Monique, uh, I was wondering, you uh, said the pile of application forms on the desk. What would you suggest? I think in the application process, some needs to change to reduce that to getting the right person yeah. first of all on the interview and maybe that person is not even there in the form so yeah. how would you suggest doing that um, the thing that I often recommend to, to clients is, is giving actually a case study of someone who's in that position because right now the non-starter the thing that must have you must have to have in order to work in the organization are these skills this experience this level of education which of course is important I'm not trying to downplay the importance of skills, but if you can have a case study of what the environment really looks like, how you've dealt with conflict, how performance and feedback is really given, whether you're working as individuals or in a team and what that experience really looks like, I know that as a job seeker, if I saw that there was a job opportunity where everyone was isolated, everyone was working at an individual, there was no micromanagement or very little feedback, that wouldn't be an experience that I was looking for and I might move on to the next, or the next opportunity. Now, I don't think that when you see that and you don't 
that person doesn't want to work for you, that that's a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing. Because if that person comes into the organization and realizes six months later after you spend 20,000 euro training them, then they leave, then it's not only a huge financial burden that you're going to have to weigh on, but there's no advance of the company as well. That means then also for the employers rewriting a lot of vacancy texts because that's also a certain format where, it right. where, where, where doesn't allow the case study to be written, to be honest. Right, and, that's, and I think that change needs to certainly take place. Isn't it funny how we recommend to candidates, right? Tailor your CV, tailor your application mm -hmm. process, tailor your covering letter right for the job that you're going for. Mm -hmm. And now we're figuring out how to do that and beat the robots, right? That's right. And yet, as employers, we don't think about it from that perspective. We think about what's the minimum amount we can shove out to get the most workload, I mean, uh, candidates yeah. coming back, right? It I makes no sense. I was talking to one of my friends, actually, who was proud that they sent 50 resumes out to 50 different companies. I'm thinking, no, you're nuts. That's crazy. How do we know you're going to find the right opportunity? Is there, is there time for one more? Yeah, definitely. We've got uh, one more st back here. Statistically, they're going to end up with the wrong opportunity. Well, yeah, if, if you, you're just if shooting you're in the, the dark. Job for the wrong right? reasons. And I think it's a mutual conversation that needs to be had. What's your name? What's your question? Hi, I'm David. Do you think video applications would help that? Uh, I think that, again, it's a two-way street. So I think video applications from the employer's perspective certainly is important. But I think that if you had a video profile of you in your position so that the applicant can actually see who you are and what that experience looks like as well, then I think that, again, it's mutually beneficial. And so I don't think that when we're looking to hire people, we have to cater it all to this next generation or the one after or the one after that. It has to be a mutually beneficial relationship that's created. And so to see a video application from an applicant is really important. But I think to see a video profile of who it is they're going to be working with and why is equally important. One last question. Anybody? No, well, Eric's uh, going to be really generous with his time. He's offered yep. to uh, stick around at the back. So if you do have some questions or maybe something you didn't want to share in an open space, he'll, uh, he'll take that on. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Eric. Great. And Thank you very much, guys. I know you were admiring the hall with all the tents in earlier, and we couldn't let you go. <laughs> A campus party tent, so thank that you, you very had much. almost the full campus all party right, experience. All right, it's going back to Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks, guys.